Good morning, everyone. It's time to begin our worship this morning at Family Life. We're so glad for those who have come today. And we're happy that we get the opportunity to praise and worship the Lord. Can you believe it's August already? Hallelujah. The good thing about it being August now is that October's coming. Hallelujah. And we know by October it's going to cool off. So just a couple months of this heat to go. <laughs> Hallelujah. But praise the Lord for the rain we had this week. That was some cooling rain. Had a couple of uh, nice evenings where the rain came through and refreshed us. So praise the Lord for that. But we're thankful for each one who's gathered together today to worship the Lord. For those who are joining us online, thanks for coming. We pray that the Holy Spirit will minister life to you today. We have a wonderful scripture to share. Oh, wow. We could, we could just preach a message probably off of this scripture. I don't know which way pastor's going today. He may, he may change his whole message when he hears this. Hallelujah. It's Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It says, the life of freedom. Christ has set us free to live a free life. Hallelujah. Did you hear that? Christ has set you free to live a free life. So take your stand. Never let anyone put a harness of slavery on you. Hallelujah. That's what the Word of God says, and that is applicable to our lives today more than ever. We're not going to allow any, any other government, we're not going to allow any other worldview to put a harness of slavery upon us, but we're going to serve Jesus boldly and we're going to proclaim his name. Hallelujah. Join us as we worship today. Hallelujah.
can count on you, God, because you are faithful, O Lord. There's no shadow of turning with our God, but you are faithful, Lord, and we can count on you today. Hallelujah. Come on, how many give praise on to him today? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God who is with them when we can't be with them, God. Nothing is impossible for you. We worship you, God, that you make a way where there seems to be no way. You're our provider. You're our savior, our redeemer. And we worship you this morning. Thank you. 
Do we believe that today? Come on, do we believe that he's our portion this morning? Come on, would you just thank him today that you can put your trust in him, that he's our healer, that he's our deliverer. He's the one who sets us free. Thank you, Lord. We rejoice today in you, our God, for great is our Lord. Worthy is he to be exalted. Come on, Lord, we thank you today nothing is impossible for our God. Come on, if you believe that, come on, declare it to him. Lord, nothing is impossible for you. Come on, every one of us in this room today are believing God, I'm sure, for a miracle. Do we believe that nothing is impossible for our God? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We declare it today, Lord. Oh, God. Lord, it's not impossible for you to save that unsaved loved one, that one we've been praying for. It's not impossible, Lord, for you to bring healing. Hallelujah. Come on, if you need healing today, I lift up my hands and say, Lord, I declare nothing's too hard for you. Nothing's impossible for you. Come on, just receive today by faith the miracle that you're asking God for in your own life, knowing that God's able to do far above what we can ask or even think. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are an awesome and a mighty God. Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. Come on, if you believe that with all your heart, today, would you give him an offering of praise this morning? Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And everybody shouted, Amen. Amen. Remain standing and turn with me in your Bibles today to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I want to read just a couple verses, verses 14 and 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. It says this. It says, we are ruled by the love of Christ. Now that we recognize that one man died for everyone, which means that they all share in his death. He died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves but only for him who died and was raised to life for their sake. Come on, how many know that's talking about us today, being raised up with Christ? Come on, are you thankful for Jesus today? My message this morning is ruled by the love of Christ. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you for your people, Lord. I thank you for those that are here. I thank you for those that are watching I thank you for those that, Lord, are out today. Uh, Lord, on this last week, I guess, last weekend before school. Lord, I just pray, Lord, you'll be with each one. Be with us here today, Lord, as we just look into the perfect law of liberty. And Lord, may your word go forth and not return void. But may it accomplish your purpose in each of our lives. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated, ruled by the love of Christ. On this, on this day that we, ce we, that we celebrate the sacrifice of our Lord through the receiving of communion, there are, there are two things that we must make the priority of our lives. And that is, first of all, a deep personal relationship and love for the person of Jesus Christ. You know, there's a lot of people say, well, I, I know about God. It's not knowing about God, it's knowing God. It's having a relationship with him. And secondly, your place in being that one, 
Each one of you has a place in being that one that represents and makes visible Jesus Christ to those lives that you touch. Come on. Every one of us touch lives. Every one of us. And we have a place to make Jesus Christ visible to each one. So what should be the defining mission of our lives in 2022? It's to demonstrate the character of God's love in such a way that brings all people into a greater understanding and relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, that's our, that's our mission today in our lives. But it's also to be a body of believers here in Spring, Texas, to be a church where the love of Christ is lived out. Come on, how many want to be a part of a church where the love of Christ is lived out? Amen. Loving people. You know, this morning I'd like to look for a moment at the issue of our, of our own personal love for Jesus. Because, you know, from Christ's conversation with Peter there on the shores of Lake Tiberias, we see that it's, it's committed and passionate love for our Lord is what qualifies us, really, to fulfill the plans and the purposes that God has for each of our lives. Now, that's important today that we realize, and I know I say that a lot, but how many know it's, it's vitally important for you to understand today that Jesus Christ, Almighty God, has a plan and a purpose for every one of your lives? Amen. If that is true, which it is true, then you need to ask yourself, how do I fulfill that plan? How do I fulfill that purpose that God had for me even before I was born, not on the day you were born, but while you were being formed in your mother's womb, God had a plan and a purpose. He planned every one of your days out. How many know it's important for us to understand what qualifies us to carry that out? Amen? You see, only when you can answer the Lord's question, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? You know, in this day, in this culture, that's a loaded question. Because how many know we got a lot of these around us? Come on. Do you love me more than these? Obviously, to Peter, it meant something. And to us, it means something. And unless we can answer that today with an uncompromising, yes, Lord, I do. I do. I do love you with all of my heart and all of my soul, all of my spirit, and with the unselfish sacrifice of all my life. Until we can say that and when we can say that, then we're going to hear a command from the Lord of his purpose then feed my lambs, care for my sheep, feed my little sheep. You see, Jesus Christ, he spoke of a time. It was the end of the ages there on the Mount of Olives with his disciples there in Matthew chapter 24. And he lists several things that will be the signs of that time. And just and again, we're talking about the Gospels in Sunday school, and I happen to be in the Gospels. I'm in Luke right now, where Jesus is giving the signs, the things that are going to take place. But one of the things that Jesus said is going to happen is he said this, many people's love will grow cold. Many people's love will grow cold. How many believe today that that very prophetic declaration of Christ is being manifested in people's lives more now than ever in our history? Do we see the absence of love? Do we see love growing cold in this all around us? In the nation, among people? I read, uh, I read one time just recall it as I was thinking about this, that one time 
92%. How many know 92% of anything is high? 92% of these Christians that were attending a Bible conference, a Bible conference, admitted in a survey that was given to them that feelings of loneliness are a major problem in their lives. 92%. All shared a basic symptom, a sense of despair at feeling unloved and a fear of being unwanted or unaccepted. Now, how many believe that's a pretty tragic commentary on the people whom Christ said, by this all men will know that you are my, dis my disciples if you have love for one another. It's in John 13, 5. 92% of Christians. We're a, we're a small crowd today. But if that stood true, 92% in this group felt unloved, unwanted. Maybe it gives a picture of why people are struggling as they are. But I thought this, if that's, if that's the way a majority of Christians feel, how do you think that one that doesn't know Christ, that's not been exposed, to the compassion, redeeming, and reconciling love of God. That neighbor of yours, that neighbor, that one at work who seems to be so irritating, that one you seem to run in a lot, you seem to run into a lot lately, and you're wondering, why do I keep seeing that person? And you're wondering why, and a multitude of others. I think, how do they feel? How do they feel? Here's a quote I, I read. It says, Jesus wants us to see that neighbor next door or the people sitting next to us on a plane or in a classroom or on our job they're not interruptions to our schedules. They are there by divine appointment. Jesus wants us to see their needs and their loneliness and their longings. And he wants us. He wants us. He wants to give us the courage to reach out to them. You know, the reason I always say this, but in, in my, my message is somewhere, the reason I ask for you to pray for a greater and more passionate love for Christ is that it will bring you to a place that it brought Paul, Paul the Apostle. There in Corinthians, I read it, 5.14. What did Paul say? He said, the love of Christ. King James, New King James says, it compels me. The Living Bible says, it controls me. Today's English version says, it rules me, the love of Christ. Can you see here the place that the love of Christ is to have in each and every one of our lives. It's, a, it's to come, for us to come to the place where the love of Christ in us, it's just a, yeah, I love God or I love people. No, it's something that's compelling us. It's something that's controlling us. It's something that when we get up in the morning, it rules us. It rules us. It rules our day. His love is the flame that kindles our love. With Paul, one writer said that this love carried him on like a relentless torrent. 
Paul the Apostle. What an amazing, amazing man that he was. You see, Paul has always been looked upon as the, the paragon or the model of excellence for Christians. But, you know, while he lived, there wasn't a lot of encouragement for him. You read about him. Not a lot of encouragement to serve to sustain him. What he had more than other men were not praises, but labors and reproaches. There in 1 Corinthians. They basically attack Paul, and, and he's really hurt by that. And that's when he writes the letter to 2 Corinthians. But he says to that one that hurt him, Anybody ever had somebody hurt you? But he wrote in 2 Corinthians that one that had hurt him, you know, don't shun him. Don't, don't shut him out. You still need to love him. You see, he was able through, he was able though to endure everything thrown his way. I just, just read that. Just read the things that he went through, how many times he received 39 stripes. That's one less for death. 40 will kill you. 39 leaves you barely hanging on. He had it happen five times. Five times. Paul was beaten stone. They stoned him and drug him out of the city. Thought he was dead. Everybody was kind of standing around. All of a sudden, he shakes himself, jumps up, and goes right back into the city. Right back. And then he'll return there even afterwards to Antioch. And he'll return to the place, Lystra, and the places where they stoned him. He was only able to endure those things thrown at him. It was, believe me, it was not out of some religious exercise or rhetoric. But because Paul had in him a mainspring of faith uh, and energy produced from his love of Christ. Again, many people saw him brave the greatest perils I mentioned, oppose the greatest powers, make the greatest sacrifices. Again, the question is, what was the principle that moved him to do all of that? How did he do that? Certainly those that observed Paul didn't understand it, couldn't understand really what drove him. Uh, you know, if it had been out of selfish ambition or uh, desire to gain wealth, they'd have probably understood. Yeah, I know why that guy's doing that. You ever said that about something? Well, I know, I know why he's doing that. He's doing that because of this. He's doing that with Paul. I can't get with this guy. I don't understand what in the world this guy's doing. But what motivated him was the love of Christ, his love for Christ. Do you love me more than these? It was his love of Christ that can only be understood by that one who has it. I might as well be speaking Chinese to someone who doesn't understand that. They don't grasp it. It's only that one that has experienced that love of Christ. You see, love alone can interpret love. Unfortunately, as you well know, this society, our culture, has seen way more an example of selfish ambition and desire for monetary gain coming from those who claim to speak for and represent God than they have a passionate love demonstrated for the sole purpose of seeing people's lives brought to a place of reconciliation and, and connection with a loving Savior. How many believe that ought to be our greatest goal in this house? Come on. Amen. To help people to be reconciled with God. Isn't, don't we have a ministry? Of, haven't we been given a word of reconciliation? Haven't we been given a mission, a, miss, a ministry of reconciliation where the Lord says, then get out there and beg them to come in that my house may be full. That's passion. That's love. That's not worrying about what it looks like or what somebody thinks about me. It's being compelled. It's being controlled and ruled 
by the love of Christ that will cause us to live like Paul, and that is dangerously. Paul lived dangerously. Brennan Manning, in his book, The Signature of Jesus, he presents a, a radical alternative to the normal, everyday, ho-hum comfort zone mentally lived on by many Christians. It's where many Christians live. It's kind of, an, oh, you know, whatever, oh, um, yeah, it's comfortable as long as I'm happy. His final statement in the book says this, and I quote, the signature of Jesus is offered to Christians who want to live by faith and not mere religion, who have not forgotten that they are followers of a crucified Christ who know that following him means living dangerously, who want to live the gospel without compromise, who have no greater desire than to have his signature written on the pages of our lives. End of quote. When you look at Paul's life, you see that statement lived out. Again, Paul had a love affair, if you will, with Jesus Christ that compelled him in everything that he did and said. So what is the genesis of this love? It's that you and I come to the understanding of Christ's love for us. Verse 14 says, Now that we recognize that one man died for everyone. How many are glad for that man, Jesus Christ, today? Aren't you glad for that? Again, I, I read something the other day. I, I, I can't remember where, so many. But I, I thought, I wrote it down and said, this would make a good sermon. And that is, am I in Adam or am I in Christ? Think about that. Am I in Adam or am I in Christ? I'm glad for the second Adam this morning. I'm glad for Jesus Christ, aren't you? There's a great hymn called The Power of the Cross. It says this, the power of the cross is ruling my life. The power of the cross has saved me. Oh, let my life be lost in the power of the cross. What's the power of the cross? Love. How many know it's love that produced this? That's the power of the cross. It's the love that Jesus Christ had for each of us. The amazing love of a God that gave his only begotten son while we were yet sinners. I just happened to be again in the book of Leviticus. And I'm again being reminded of how thankful I am for Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus, once and for all, he paid the price. No more bulls, no more goats, no more sheep, no more pigeons, no more turtle doves or a handful of flour because you were poor. Jesus paid the price. Jesus paid it all. Hallelujah. Can you take a moment and say, thank you, Jesus, for paying for it all once and for all. Hallelujah. And brother, sister, that ought to compel you. That ought to control you. That ought to rule your life because of this, because of the cross, because of what Jesus did for you. It's not religion, it's relationship. Amen. Come on, it's relationship. It's, it's that we recognize what our Lord and Savior Jesus did for us there on the cross. And that's, of course, when we receive communion, we do that in remembrance of that, amen? Amen. And how many know it was the unconditional love 
that he had for the world, for you and me, that nailed him on that cross. That's what put him on the cross. It should, we, it should cause each one of us today to cry out, let my life, let my life be lost in the power of that incredible love. And Paul continues in verse 14, which means they, us, all share in his death. Come on, how many know the cross is not just a nice necklace we wear? Or something that we may hang above the baptistry. It's more than that. It's a symbol of death. Symbol of death. Actually, a quite horrible symbol of death. You would think it pretty weird if you saw somebody with a necklace that had a guillotine on the end of the necklace. You go, whoa, that's kind of dark, isn't it? What are you doing wearing a guillotine around your neck? Well, a cross is much worse than a guillotine. Or someone hanging a gold noose at the end of a chain around their neck. You say, what, man, what's your problem? Are you, what are you, are you dark? Are, are you have a dark nature about you? What are you doing with a, a, a necklace hanging a noose around your neck? Cross is a lot worse than that. Come on, how many know what I'm saying? It's a horrible symbol of death. So we are not to stand back and just, just recognize the death. Oh yeah, we see that. We recognize the death and suffering of Christ on the cross, but we are to embrace it and we are to share in it. Paul said in Philippians 3.10, I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. Oh, man, preach that in most churches today and you'll get people looking cross-eyed at you. What are you talking about? You see, before Paul said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. Boy, you'd everybody shouting on that one. Glory to God, so do I. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to know the power of his resurrection. But this is what he said immediately afterwards. I also want to suffer with him and share with him in his death. See, people want the good part. They don't want to, they don't want to take that other part. It's no wonder that so many Christians today, so many feel, again, 92% disconnected from that love. Feeling unloved, unwanted, unaccepted. Listen, people will starve. I tell you the truth. People will starve if they just feed on mere rhetoric. Come on. If they, if they just dine on mere words or they sup on empty ceremonies. And again, I've been around the church all my life. From the day I was born, I've been in the church. And I've been in active ministry for over 50 years. And I stand dumbfounded today at the rhetoric, the empty words and the hollowness of so much that is presented as the life and way of Christianity. Blows my mind. It's, it's those with a voice to declare the truth, yet settle for just a form of godliness and not being more deliberate in declaring like Paul, I know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Do you know that Paul was a rabbi? He was mentored by Gamaliel. He wasn't just some guy that, you know, kind of just had a mean spirit in him and then God said, well, I'm going to change him. He was a rabbi. He knew all about the law. He was a Pharisee. His dad was a Pharisee. His parents living in Tarsus, a Roman city. And he was around that and he knew that. He understood that. But he said, I know nothing save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I believe it's, it's why so many, and I believe it's many in the church today are in a state of disconnectedness. And that is that they're they're disconnected from the truth of God who is and, and, and has a genuine understanding of love that was demonstrated through Christ's death on the cross. You see, and the, the, the problem with that is if we miss it here, we miss it everywhere. 
How many understand that the cross is central to, to our salvation today? We miss it here. We miss it everywhere. But if we get it here, Paul says in verse 15, we no longer live for ourselves, but only for him who died and was raised to life for our sake. Hallelujah. Come on, how many know we'd just be like any other old religion today if Jesus didn't come forth from the grave? Come on, how many know Confucius is dead? Muhammad's dead. Come on, Buddha's dead. But Jesus is alive. Come on, hallelujah. That's why every day is Easter for us. Hallelujah. Because Jesus is alive. Do you see the incredible need for us as a church, as Family Life Christian Center, to be a people committed to demonstrating the character of God's love in such a way that it brings all people into a greater understanding and relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know what that, that is? Again, that's Micah 4. How many times have we talked about that? That those ones that will come running to the house of God, they're going to want to know God's ways and they're going to know how to walk in God's paths. And that's what Paul is saying here. That's what we've got to be committed to. Doesn't matter our size. God can use us in mighty ways. How many believe that? I don't know all that God has for us. I don't know. I don't have any clue, really. Just believe God is going to use us. But however he does, how many believe we can demonstrate the size that we are? We can demonstrate the character of God's love to people. Come on. That we can strive to be in this community in Spring, Texas. We can be a place where the love of Jesus Christ is lived out. Hallelujah. I want to be that type of church, don't you? But not by myself as the pastor or just a handful of leadership, but by every single one of us. Come on, going outside these walls. Come on, how many believe God's called us to go outside these four walls? To our neighborhoods, our place of employment, in our classrooms, in the restaurants, or wherever we may be, that we might be a living demonstration of the character of Christ's love. That, I promise you, will draw people in. will bring them to a place of wanting to be connected to know more about God. Because he's obviously a reality in your life. And they want more, know, know more about that. Come on, how many remember the word last week? Come on, you remember the word? That because of what God will do in what? Come on, say it. One day. one day. Because of what God will do in one day, it says there in the next verse, everyone will bring his neighbor. It doesn't say, and a few select folks will bring their neighbor. Uh, maybe one or two will bring their neighbor. My Bible says everyone. Everybody say everyone. everyone. My Bible says that everyone will bring his neighbor. Yeah. If that is true, which I believe it is, I believe that's the rhema word. If we hear that today, I believe with all of my heart it's true. Then the question is this. What's that going to look like? I just read, Ed had given me the book, read it in Argentina. And you can do relative on the numbers. But they started off, they had done a big campaign and crusade and they had passed out all these flyers and gone house to house and they got a, they got a stadium seating 40,000 people and the first night of the crusade they had 8,000. Now you can take this in relative numbers. When God begins to move, he begins to move in people. And I want to see God. How many want to see with me? See God do mighty deeds in this church. Yeah. Healings, signs, wonders, miracles, casting out demons and devils. Come on, we have authority. 
to cast out devils and demons, see people healed, the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. How many believe he still does that today? Come on, he does that today. And I tell you, we're one miracle away from a mighty move of God. We're one, we're one devil being kicked out of somebody's life and then being set free like the man in the Gadarenes that ran home and tell, told the whole city what had happened to him. We're one demon-possessed person being set free from a mighty move of God. Some of you believe that. Some of you look at me like a deer in the headlights going, what are you talking about? Come on, friend. We're one miracle away. Started with 8,000. Next night they had 9,000. I thought, this is good. Kept going. By the end of it, by in just a few weeks of it, they had over 100,000 people that had come. They had to get another stadium. They had over 100,000 people come. And all the churches in that area. See, that's why we, we're not in competition with anybody. God bless these churches, whatever they're doing. God bless Grace up there today. And, and, and God bless Brother Hogan over here at Spring First and what God's doing through them. God bless them. I hope they blow up. I mean, good blow up. I don't mean bad blow up. I hope they blow up. I, I pray they have revival in their place. Come on. Every person is hungry for God because I tell you, God moves. And every church that's hungry for God, God will fill those with people. And we better be ready. Because those churches, because I told you before, the church in Argentina weren't that big. Had 100,000 people coming to the stadium, thousands, 30,000 getting saved. They got to go somewhere. Amen. And I want to be the church that's ready to receive because that's when you get excited and bring your neighbor. How many think a lot of people brought their neighbors to that meeting there in Argentina? And thousands, and it said every church was full, and they had, they had to start scheduling five, six church, uh, five, six services a day. Most people can't make it in one, but they'll come. You better believe they'll come, because God will be on the move. Come on, I want to be a church. Hallelujah. How many believe when they come, we got to be ready to love, embrace, and minister to all those neighbors being brought? Because it'll get messy. Revival is messy. The move of God is messy. Especially when them demons start manifesting. You better, you better be in a good relationship with the Lord when that stuff starts happening. Amen. If you don't know that, just trust me when I say that. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on, we will be a people today ruled by the love of Christ. Amen? May the words ring in our ears today. Do you love me more than these? Then feed my sheep, feed my lambs, care for my sheep. As the scripture says in James 4, 8, draw close to God and he will draw close to you. And when we draw close to him and recognize the great and the awesome love revealed in Christ through his death on the cross. Hallelujah. We will become those ones who are compelled, who are controlled, and who are ruled by the love of Christ and demonstrating that love in a real and a tangible way to those who need Jesus. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Come on, let's stand to our feet right now and let's just ask the Lord and let's just tell the Lord, really, we don't need to ask him. We just need to say, God, that's, that's me, Lord. Come on, declare your love for the Lord today. Ask him right now to, to fill you. If it's not there, then ask him to fill you today with a greater, a greater passion, a greater sense of his love. Come on, let him, let him, Shed his love abroad in your heart today in a new and a fresh way. Oh, say, Lord, I, I want to know you in that way. I want to know you like Paul knew you, how he loved you, how he cared, had that desire, oh God, to serve you and then to serve others. Hallelujah, to have that love. Have that love. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 
Oh, to have that love, that love of God in our hearts be shed abroad in our hearts that we might be people that are ruled by that love. Hallelujah. You know, Paul, when he was, he was bound, went there in, in Jerusalem and he was bound and, you know, Agabus had given him a prophecy. That, you, you, the man who wears, he's going to be, he's going to be bound. And this, the very thing happened, you know, to Paul. And it says, uh, you know, they beat, they beat him. They beat Paul at that point. And uh, they beat him so bad when, when Lysias had sent the uh, garrison down there, the soldiers down there to get him. You know, they, it says they stopped beating Paul. But uh, in the next couple of verses, it says that, that the soldiers had to carry Paul up. I mean, he was, they beat him good. And that the soldiers had to, had to carry him up the desert. And still Paul said, wait a minute. And he asked Lysias, can I, can I speak to the crowd? You'd think he'd want to spit in their eye. They just got through beating the fire out of him. You'd think he'd want to, you know, curse at them. But no, he wanted, he wanted to speak to them. And he said, yeah, go ahead and speak to them. And then he, he speaks with him because he had such a love for them as people. He wanted to see them come to that saving grace. Even those that were calling for his death. There when he stood before, uh, before uh, King Agrippa. Not King Agrippa. Uh, King, yeah. Is that right? Am I saying that right? It's King Agrippa, isn't it? King Agrippa. Yeah. With Festus. But anyways, uh, you know, that's when he said, Agrippa said, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. You know, Paul said, I would that you, and, and, and all these years, these are the people who wanted to kill him. They had conspired for years to kill him, or to made a pact to kill him. Not only do for you, Agrippa, but for all of these here today, I would that you would all come to a saving knowledge of Christ and have what I have except for these chains. That's how much Paul loved the people. We got to have that kind of love. Amen. We got to have that kind of love to see people. Paul, the ama his amazing life and the people he won to the Lord. And the, and the Gentiles, you all know that. The, he was called to the Gentiles. Mighty man of God. But it was all because of the love he had because of the love of Christ had poured in him, he was able to pour that love out. Can we, can we say, Lord, help me to pour that love out in my life today? Can you ask the Lord, Lord, would you give me that kind of love today? Would you give me that kind of love that my life would be like Paul's and ruled by it? Lord, that I would just be controlled by, by love in my life. Let my life be controlled by you. Now we're going to receive communion. And what that is, is celebrating, of course, that love. That's what this is. This is love right here. It's love that compelled him to have his body broken, broken and to shed his blood. Love drove him to do that because God so loved the world. But you see, Jesus had to make the choice. He laid down his life. The father didn't force him. He said, I lay down my life. I make that choice. God gave him, but he had to make the choice. It was out of love God had for you and out of the love that Jesus had for you that he was willing to go to the cross. Isn't that amazing? Now, I know most all of you in this room, I, I mean, I don't know, you know, know you super personally. Some of you, I know a lot about you. But I'm sure if somebody at that conference would have been told, hey, you know, 92% of the people that are here at this Bible conference are people that are really struggling with loneliness, not feeling loved, not being accepted. He would go, oh, come on, you're, you're kidding me. You know, there's a lot of us that there are things in us that we've never shared with anybody. We wouldn't share with anybody because we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to think, have somebody think of us, well, I'm, I'm this or that or you know, think less of me because I may, I may not feel that way. I may feel like I'm, I'm unwanted or I'm unloved. 
you want to go like those people that come. How in the world can you feel that way when you know what Christ has done for you? But how many know the devil's a liar and the father of liars? How many know he can get in this thing here called the mind? And he can wreak a lot of havoc. We all have to fight because the enemy wants to bring those thoughts of, of uh, you're not worthy or you're not loved or nobody cares about you or you'll never amount to anything or on and on and on. I mean, there's just so much that the devil does. I, I, it would break my heart to think that with everything that we stand for in this church and the things that we've declared in this church, there were people that, that still don't feel like you're loved or important. I know that Gabby told a great testimony of that one time and powerful testimony of her own life. We just don't, you know, we just don't know sometimes what's going on. But this morning, I want to just, if you in any way feel like that, if any way that you feel, before we receive communion, I wanna, I wanna pray for you. Because you need to be set free from that. Because it may be a little thought right now, but if you don't take care of it, it's gonna blow itself up into a stronghold that you're gonna have a hard time dealing with. Is that right, Gabby? It builds up. Because the devil's not just gonna shoot a little thought. Oh, he's gonna start with that thought and see if we're going to be naive enough or to, to receive that thought. And then if he says, hey, oh, okay, okay, that, that gives me entrance now. I, I see I can make headway with this one. So then he starts to bring more and more. Then he may bring somebody uh, along to say something to us that just crushes us and it just reinforces that feeling. But I say again, the devil's a liar and the father of liars. You are men and women of God. Come on, everybody say, I'm a man or a woman of God. Come on. You've been bought with a price. It's been paid for. You tell the enemy you're a liar. I'm a child of the living God. I've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm no longer a stepchild. I'm a son of the king. Hallelujah. I'm a son of the free woman, not a son of the bond woman. I'm a son of the free. Come on, we sang about it today. When you were singing, I'm free, I'm free. Come on, that's more than a song. That's a way of life. We're free as people of God. Free from the bondage of those things, of those thoughts, though those lies of the enemy. We're free. Hallelujah. But I want to pray right now. And, and I'm just going to have you, you know, stay right there where you are. I'm just going to pray. And just let the Holy Spirit work in your life right now. But if, if you say in some measure, in some way, yeah, I, I understand that those feelings, because the enemies attack me with those feelings. And, and, and I want to today, I need to be strengthened. I need to be encouraged. I need, I need for the word of the Lord to cleanse my mind right now. If that's you, just raise up your hand. I want to pray for you today. If that's you, come on. If you're saying, man, I've, I, I've struggled with some of those things. It's all right. We've all done it. Actually, I'm raising my hand right now because I want to be strong in the Lord. I don't want, I don't want to believe any lie of the enemy. Come on today. As I pray, you want me to pray for you that God will help you and strengthen you. Come on, lift up that hand. Let me pray for you. Amen. Amen. It's nothing to be, nothing to be feel bad about or like, wow, you know, woe is me. I must be not a good Christian. No, no, it's not an issue of being a good Christian. It's an issue of letting the Lord work in your life. Amen. Heavenly Father, I just thank you right now. You know every heart. Lord, you know every, the inner depths. I, I just read that. Lord knows the heart. 
It's the very center of our lives. He knows our heart. He knows your heart. Those of you that just raised that hand, Lord knows exactly your heart. The Lord knows exactly your mind and your thoughts. He knows the things that the enemy has tried to uh, promulgate in your mind and bring to your mind and, and, and cause you to feed on. But right now in the name of Jesus, I curse every thought of the enemy. Come on, those of you that raise your hand, you take that authority right now. Say, Satan, you're a liar and I tear down those thoughts. I cast down those imaginations. Come on, do it right now. I cast down every imagination Every imagination of the enemy, I cast it down now in the mighty name of Jesus. I cast it down. And Lord, I pray for you to strengthen us, all of us, Lord, that we all might walk in that confidence, being confident of this very thing, that he that has begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. So in the name of Jesus, be set free from those lies of the enemy now in the name of Jesus. Now lift both those hands and thank him right now that you're free in the name of the Lord. Declare it. Declare that you're free. Declare I'm free. I'm free from those things. I'm free from those lies of the enemy in Jesus' name. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen and amen, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. You can be seated for just a moment. We're going to receive communion together, those helping me this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't he wonderful? Isn't the Lord wonderful? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Yeah, we'll go ahead and put those on so those watching, you can join us. Go ahead. You can watch us. I mean, you can watch us. You are watching us. You can join with us in communion. Let's get a piece of bread, some juice, whatever. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, today I'm just praying that, the, that as we receive communion this morning, that there will be such a sense of God's love in that, in that receiving of that, that his body and his blood. Hallelujah. We thank you for it, Lord. Glory to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. So you don't hold in your hand, even though technically you do, just juice and a wafer. What you hold in your hand is the love of God. That's the love of God in grape juice and a cracker representing the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's love that nailed him to the cross. And he wants to pour that same love out in our hearts so that we can be that church that he's called us to be. We can be that, that people that he's called us to be. But that's what this is. This is love in our hands. It's the love of God lived out. Hallelujah. So the Lord, he took the bread on the night he was betrayed and said, this is my body which is broken for you. When you do this, do this in remembrance of what I'm about to do. So Lord, we thank you today on this beautiful Sunday morning, Lord, with each one of these precious people in this room and those precious people that are watching right now. Lord, I just pray today, Lord, that we will have such a revelation, that we will feel such a love uh, just absolutely invade our hearts and our minds in thinking of what the price that you paid for our salvation because of your love. And may that love be shed abroad in our hearts that we might be people that are, again, Con compelled and controlled and ruled by that same love. So Lord, we just thank you for this, this symbol of your body. And today, may it just bring a wholeness to us, to our minds and spirits. Lord, especially those ones, and of course all of us at one time or another has been in that place where those thoughts have been in our minds, but they're free from that today. 
But Lord, I just thank you for the body that completely makes us whole. Hallelujah. Makes us whole. And so, Lord, we thank you for this symbol. We just ask you to bless it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's partake of the, the body this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your willingness to be broken. And Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for the blood that you shed. Lord, when the crowns, of course, when they slapped you and struck you with their fists, when they pressed that crown of thorns down on your head and you were bleeding profusely from your brow, and then when they put the stripes on your back, opening up your back to such to, to just a, a, such a flow of blood that was unbelievable. Nails in your hands and your feet and the spear in your side and water and blood ran out. But your blood, your blood today is a symbol of freedom. Your blood today is a symbol of liberty. There's power in the blood to save us, heal us, and set us free. So we thank you, Lord, today that we are set free. We are free by the power of the blood of Jesus, redeemed by the blood of Jesus. So Lord, we thank you for this symbol of your blood today. And we wanna to partake together, Father, in faith and thanking you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's take together this morning. Mm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now just. Just give him thanks for all that he's done, all that he's done in you, all that he's going to do in you. Thank him for what he's going to do in this church, because you're a part of this church. So let's thank God for what he's going to do in this house. Thank you, Lord, for Family Life Christian Center. Thank you for every person that is a part of this church. And Lord, we thank you for those, Lord, today that you're raising up to be used by you in a mighty way in these last days. We just thank you for that, Lord. We give you all the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Praise God, praise God. Well, praise the Lord. It's been great to be in the house of the Lord. Just turn around before you leave and love on somebody in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah.